I didn't understand what was going on around me, and maybe it's better that I didn't understand. My goal was to live. These murders were allowed by the world because the world knew what was happening to us, but they did not hear our cries. I think it's important that we keep talking about this because it's a big part of our Jewish history. Their story is very special to us and we're gonna pass on their story. We're gonna make sure this never happens again. There were 150,000, only 200 survived. I am one of those 200. They survived such a hard time and that they're telling the story is really so amazing. I am very scared at night. I don't sleep. I, I have the television on the whole night. I go home and it's late at night. I, I, I look all around, and see if nobody follows me. It affects me a lot. They're really brave for speaking to us and reliving those bad times. Speaking to young students is securing a future that you're interested, that you will follow along, and the stories of survivors are important to listen to and I am truly honored. We're the future and we need to be proud of who we are, you know, truly stand up. When the Holocaust, they all got tattoos with numbers on their arms and that's what they were known by. We were a number, we weren't a person no more. We are not just numbers on, an, on our arms, we have our own identity. So I think names not numbers mean that there's more to a person than just what they've been through and there's always a deeper meaning in what they have been through. You shouldn't describe someone based on what's on their body or how they act. You should describe someone as a, by their personality. The name of this project means like, instead of remembering six million Jews died, you remember these are real people that actually like went through a hard time. 10 people died, 20 people died. A kid just died on the floor. That kid has a family, he has a life. The first time I heard about the Holocaust, I was probably around seven. Probably in fourth grade. It hit me really hard when I heard. And I was like shocked at how like this person could do this. My father's aside, his um, his grandparents went through the Holocaust. My grandmother, t I asked her a lot about it. Um, I remember in first grade, I actually made a project about him. I've been watching Names Not Numbers for like the past four years, waiting and waiting until I was in eighth grade so that I could do it with my grandmother. Cause when she finally agreed to it, my mom was so happy that she could actually do it with me. What you're about to enter is a journey which we are fortunate enough to take part in every year. And for many, it will change your lives. And for others, you won't necessarily know how it changes your life until later down the line. All of you over the next number of months are going to have this chut to bear witness to survivors' stories, to their testimonies. Are you able to use this experience in your lives to make sure that you carry the messages forward that you're learning from these survivors with you in life in a way that will enable you to be a leader in change for good in the world? to understand that you cannot be bystanders to injustice, that you have an obligation, a responsibility for those who perished in the Holocaust and for those who survived through the Holocaust, to make sure that you understand and use your powers to be an Avram Avinu. I decided to do Names Not Numbers because it's very important to hear the stories. And it's very important to pass down the stories so that everyone remembers what happened during the Holocaust. I wanted to experience, like, to meet them and to be able to learn and understand what they've been through. I wanted to add more proof so people who are non-believers can understand that you can't just ignore all the facts that prove that um, this horrible thing has happened. I met an incredible woman. Her name, as you'll soon meet her, is Tova Rosenberg. She is totally dedicated to an incredible thing. She's dedicated to telling the story of the victims of the Holocaust and the survivors of the Holocaust. If we forget that story, so many bad things happen. If we forget that story, we're condemned to repeat it. 
If we forget that story, we forget what we are capable of as human beings, and that is unacceptable. Today, 75 years after the end of the Holocaust, 31% of all Americans believe that two million or fewer Jews were killed in the Holocaust. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, after a trip to a concentration camp in April 1945, wrote, I made the visit deliberately in order to be in position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these as allegations and that they are propaganda. I think that if we stop talking about it, it's like pretending it didn't exist. If it didn't exist, then it could, it could very easily just happen again. There's a quote, uh, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. God forbid this ever happens again, but we should be prepared and we should stop anything that can cause this to ever happen again. When living history becomes a memory, it will be you, the students who participated in Names Not Numbers, through your documentary, you will remember the days of old, Zahor Yamoto Lam. The survivors and the students are telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. Our Names Not Numbers students are learning history, recording history, and preserving history through their work. We're going to watch what a Names Not Numbers interview looks like. We're going to hear a survivor. We were a large family. We were 11 children. I was the youngest. We were six brothers and, and five sisters. I think it's important that we keep on talking about the Holocaust. It's going to always be a part of us, and it's not something that we should forget. Me being a part of one of the last generations to interview Holocaust survivors is amazing, but also sad at the same time. It's becoming a rare chance. It makes me feel amazing, but I'm a little bit sad that my little brother may not have the chance to do this. To understand the magnitude of what it means to meet with these individuals, the seriousness with which you have this responsibility to take these testimonies and not just to retell them, but to make sure that you take these testimonies and turn them into positivity, goodness, and a way that you have influenced the world that will never let something like that happen ever again. Yesterday we began giving you an overview of the importance of Names on Numbers, the story that you are going to work together to tell. Today, we are going to begin the process of teaching you how to get that story. When you ask and do good interviews and do good questions, it doesn't matter what your background is, how much education you have, how much you've done. It matters that you have good preparation, which is absolutely key. It also matters sometimes that you have a little bit of passion about the subject that you're talking about. I prepared for the interview by discussing a lot of questions with my group and looking up uh, very interesting things about Anita Caro so we can get the best questions. I read her story so I would know like what to ask. For this interview, we took time out of the school day and we wrote questions with everyone in our group. If you think and remind yourself that the main thing you need to do is to allow them to shine. You're not the one who's shining. You're not the one who's going to show how smart you are by a list of questions and preparation you've done to show how many times you can ask a specific question. The questions are very important, but what's more important is getting a story out. If you say to them, for instance, in a question, do you remember the day of liberation? Do you remember the day that you were freed? And they say, yes. And you say, tell me about that. They may tell you about seeing soldiers come in. They'll have recollections about that day, but you can also ask them as a follow-up if they don't say it in their answer about the emotions they felt. What You don't just want to necessarily get the facts about the day of when they arrived at the camp or when they saw something happen or when the liberation came, but what you're trying to get also is to, to bring out of them some of the memories of how they felt. And they explained to us how we should act and if they start crying and 
how to deal with their emotions when we interview them. There may come a moment in which you are recounting matters that um, make them very emotional. There's a moment at which you want to reach out and say, no, that's all right. Or you want to go on to the next question to stop it. But don't rush that. If it happens, they will pull themselves back. They've been there before. And as they start to to come back in, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, which will seem like five minutes to you, but it's not that long or 20 seconds, then slowly go on to your next question. You can do it. Uh, and but just keep your own composure uh, the, to the extent you can. I prepared for my interview by um, going over the questions, um, speaking to myself in the mirror, trying to make like make myself compose so I don't make any mistakes. We all had one subject from the beginning, after, and during the war. So like three people were in each group doing those questions together, and then we put them all into one script, and then we practiced so we can have a good interview. There are three cameras set up around the room from different perspectives. Then there's also the three lights and there's a uh, boom mic. So once you press record, obviously it's going to say recording. So always make sure that we are recording. You guys taught me how to use the cameras and how to focus. And someone mentioned about the red eyes. Who mentioned you did? Okay, so that's another tool that the camera gives us. To, uh, to tell us if things are on focus or out of focus. This one does focus and this one zoom in, does zoom in and zoom out. And then a cool button that I just learned about, expanded focus. If you press it once, it zooms in and then it zooms in even more if you press it again. You could see how the image is, fo if it's focused or not. And then you can focus it with ring one. I was really nervous before we started because I'm not really used to it, to going to the cameras. I've sometimes been on camera, but not most of the time. When I sign out, it's very professional and I have to pay attention a lot. We're just going to go through audio real quick and then we're going to start. We take the mic and we hand it to the person for them to then put it underneath their shirt. And then the assistant will come around and clip it onto their shirt like so. And then we go to here to test the audio. Please count to ten for me. One, two, three. You see four, a move, right? Five. Yeah. So if the bar moves, that means we have our Testing audio, video, one, two, three. Now sing for us. Sing our song. Sing happy birthday. The camera has two channels to receive audio. Right now we are only here in uh, the channel number two. It was definitely harder than expected, first time using a camera. That camera is the one that you guys are going to actually uh, get to use more because that one is going to change uh, angles and it's going to change on uh, frames and everything. These ones are going to stay as, as they are right now. It feels exciting just to know their story. I've heard many stories about Holocaust survivors and I'm finally being able to like having someone explain it to me from their personal story. I'm a little scared because I feel like they might be like not want to say some things, but like I might not ask the right questions. I feel extremely lucky to uh, still meet with some, some uh, survivors that are left. I feel very lucky that the survivor that I get to interview is my grandmother because I know especially now there aren't a lot of survivors and to know that it's actually my grandmother and I get a chance to interview her. It's an experience that I've never gotten before. I'm feeling nervous but excited and very grateful to be able to be part of this experience. I'm really excited to learn about our Jewish heritage and what Jews in the Holocaust had to go through. I'm feeling very excited to hear her story and get very inspired by it. In a book, you don't see their emotion. Like, you can't see how they feel when they say these things. When you talk to them, you really get a feel for what they went through by the way like they say it and everything. Today, I'm going to have the pleasure of interviewing Erica Schoenfeld, and I can't wait. I am interviewing Mr. Issy Farber. I'm interviewing Gail Weinberger. I'm interviewing Anita Carl. I'm interviewing Bertha Farber. I am interviewing Alex Gross. I am interviewing Celia Kenner.
My name is Alex Gross. I was born in a small village in the Carpathian Mountains of Czechoslovakia, 1928. My name is Gail Weinberger, Czechoslovakia. My hometown was Kerecke, 1929, February 26. My name is Izzy Farber, Hebrew Israel area. I was born in Poland in a small town. The name is Kwasnik. Bertha Farber, and Hebrew is Bracha, Poland in 1935. My name is Celia Kenner. I was born in Poland in a town by the name of Lvov, December 1st, 1935. My name is Anita Karl, and I was born in Lvov, May 26, 1938. My name is Erika Schoenfeld. I was born in Vienna, Austria. We were seven brothers and one sister. The name was Philip, Ben, or Bernie, Bill, Sam, and my sister was Rosalind. It was a good life. We were very, very good parents, very good brothers, and good cousins. We had Hebrew school, what we used to call Hebrew. I played soccer, and I was pretty good at it. We were a small town. It was about 120 families. I was from a Hasidic family. We were six children, and my mother and father, and my grandmother lived with us. We had one shoe in the whole town. I went to public school, and then I went to Haider in the afternoon. My older brother was in yeshiva in uh, Uihel in Hungary. Uh, we had a very happy family. It was a beautiful town. A lot of uh, Jews, they uh, had uh, a lot of stores. They, they used to do a lot of business. We were always religious. We were kosher and uh, we went to, I went to Haida. We made Shabbos. My father used to bring in from Shuvel a lot of people to have uh, my mother prepared for about 20, 25 people for, for Shabbos. So I had uh, my brother's usher and I had a, a younger sister. She was two years, and the older sister, she was two years older than my brother, and I was the middle one. My father was a, a military tailor in, in the town. Almost all, a lot of Jews worked for him to start the trade, you know. My father was a printer. I remember my great, my grandfather with a beard, but I'm sure they, they were kosher, and they kept her Shabbos, I'm sure. I was an only child to a middle-class Jewish family. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, and my dad was um, a sheet metal worker, but very artistic, and he made different little artsy objects. We did keep kosher, but not very, um, not very orthodox. We observed Shabbat and observed kashras. I was surrounded by a very large family. It was an orthodox, patriarchal, well-to-do family in the city of Lvov. I grew up with my two sisters, uh, my mother, father, my grandparents, my uncles, cousins. The Jewish holidays and Shabbat were uh, very beautiful. We had long tables where the family got together and everything was celebrated and observed uh, according to our religion. Back then I had five half siblings. The youngest one was 16 when I was born. Before the war my father had a very successful business and everybody was very happy, but then his wife passed away and he remained with five children. And then he married my mother and then I was born. So I don't even, I didn't even know those children until I came to this country. My best friend, neighbor across the street, 
when Hungary took us over, he joined the Hitler Youth and he started hating it. He became an SS officer. I had to run away because the Hitler Youth attacked me and I beat the crap out of him. I had to run away from home. So first I ran away to one village, another village, and then finally to the capital of Hungary, Budapest. It's very painful because if there ever was an angel on the face of the earth, a beloved mother, they never liked the Jews. They never liked us. That's why we ran away. My father was the only one that he said he's getting away. He had his father, two brothers, the family, and they thought that they were, they were laughing. Nothing's going to happen to them. So we were the first one to get away in 1939. He smuggled the boat to get out from Poland. I was a baby, four years old, and my sister was two and a, 15 months younger. And I had, they had to tie me up because I was afraid of the water. And we crossed the border, and we, they, send us, they caught us and sent us to Siberia. I w was not going to be in a yeshiva. I was going to start school, regular school, in September. But this was June. I went to a dance school and I was going to be in a ballet recital and I was extremely excited about that recital. That was like the highlight of my life. The day of the recital, the ballet recital, is when the Germans invaded. The ballet recital was canceled, and my father was drafted to the Russian army, never to be seen or heard from again. Mom cried and I cried, but after a while, being a young kid, I went out to the backyard where I played with Jewish and non-Jewish kids. What they did was like shy away from me. They didn't want me close to them. And they were pointing at me like, and being pointed at uh, someone dressed in some sort of a uniform came over, dragged me to the front of the house and put me onto a truck. What I saw on the truck was a bunch of kids crying, vomiting behind a chain. And I grabbed the leg of the person that was manning this truck. And I asked him if he had children of his own. He sort of took pity and he grabbed me by my long blonde braids threw me off the truck and told me never to come back in the daylight. I came home and that's where we were all arrested and put into the ghetto. Very short time after Pesa, two, two Nazis came in to our, to our house and told us, get ready and every one of you could take one suitcase and you meet in the schoolyard. They knocked on our door and said, they said, Jews, get out. Our beloved mother kept on putting her hand on our head and face. And she said, Yankel, a wilderness lady, I want you should live. And then they took us to Munkach, to a ghetto. And there was like a few thousand people. We were taken to a ghetto in Munkach. And they gave us a small space for uh, all of us, for all of us, uh, eight, uh, seven people. We were seven people because my brother was away in yeshiva, so he wasn't with us. My father was very active. He knew a lot of uh, people in that big town, so he used to go out and get some food for us. But it was hunger already there. 
no food, no water, nothing. You had to sleep outside and it's very cold there. I remember that time there was a whole group that ran away. So the men had to cut the trees. They put up barracks. You know, they gave us some of those fish the dry, it is, I didn't know what it was, a piece of bread or anything. In the summer, you couldn't go out because the mosquitoes ate you up alive. So they had masks. And the winter was 40 below zero, I remember. And the polar bears, I remember I was a babe, they came to the door to, to, to look into us. They took everybody in the market, all the Jews out. Everybody was together and they took the woman and and young girls separate, and men and boys separate. My mother and my two sisters, they took them out and they shot them. And in front of my eyes, I saw that. They were all in one grave. About 500 people in one grave. My, my brother, my father was a tailor. He was a little older, and they took him in to work in the shop. They took me in a, in a, in a jail. I was there. Uh, two, three days, if I remember exactly. And then my father had paid somebody money and they took me out and put me on, in the, on the attic where he had the shop. I was there six months all by myself. I had bread and water, that's all I had for six months. Then I told my father that I, I don't want to live anymore. So he took me down that's how they they caught me. The assessment made me kneel for eight hours on, on my knees with a hard board. And after eight hours, he came over, he put the dog on me. He, he cut my face and part of my ear was hanging. We moved in 1940 from Vienna to Budapest because of Hitler and uh, because my father had a sister in Budapest who she said that the Hungarians are safe, don't worry, come here and you will be fine and you will live. And we were not fine because Hitler came in and took all the Jews anyway. There was no life. We were uh, locked in in apartments and in safe houses. And we were uh, running from one house to the other not to be caught and being deported. I was an infant. 18 months. On September 15, when my youngest sister Esther was born, they entered our home, they looted our house, they took everything of value and gave my parents 24 hours to move into the ghetto. The life in the ghetto was terrible. We only had a ration a day which meant to stand in line early in the morning with a, uh, with a cup and we were given water into the cup and one piece of stale bread. So this bread I ate crumb by crumb because I wanted it to last 24 hours. My mother could not work and all she could do is scrunch little pieces of food from here and there. We were forced to leave our house and our belongings and go to a ghetto in Lvov. So I went with my mother, an aunt, uncle, and two cousins, a boy and a girl, a little older than I. There was lack of food. Um, you know, freezing winters, I would go outside and play with other kids. You know, due to starvation and illness, all of a sudden, a, a kid in front of me would just lie down and I would think that, what, are they sleeping or what, are they tired? But they were sleeping permanently. Then they made the uh, basmatarish and then the uh, shoe. They made a, a camp. And that's what we go and that became a concentration camp. So they uh, took the kids away, so they, this way they, they wouldn't run away. So they put us separate. And, and they made me work in the, in the kitchen. I was peeling potatoes for about a year. 
And then they put, took a lot of people to another town, which is a concentration camp. They took all the men to a, a place called Dachau, which is a work camp. And uh, they worked very hard and, and they were being tortured. I have no idea what he did there. They did everything, probably from cutting stones to making roads. I, I, I don't know. We always lived in one of these protected houses. And as soon as the Nazis came and rounded everybody up and took them away, I don't know how my mother did it, but somehow she ran into the empty building and uh, then we ran into another house that was safe. I didn't feel anything. I was maybe two or three years old and I don't know how my mother did it. We were always starving. We were always hungry. We didn't have clothes what to wear and uh, it was a very, very difficult time. After two years, my father and the people that were there said that we're not going to survive here. So they sent us to Uzbekistan. Uzbek, they looked like, and we were living with some of them. We thought we we're going to die. We had no clothes, no food. And my father went, with my, me and my sister, they took us to that place, our north, and, and they shaved off our, our heads. But they were good to us. They gave us food, and I was there, and I don't remember how long exactly. They came to visit us, my father and my stepmother. They gave us repyoshkis outside. They baked like pretzels, and they gave me, and I saved it, so when my father came, I gave them that they should have something to eat. And my biological mother, she was forced to work outside of the ghetto in a work camp. So I was left behind with my aunt and uncle and my two cousins. And the name of the camp was Yanovska. Mom's job there was loading and unloading wagons of coal. But uh, periodically, I don't remember the frequency, she and some of the other inmates <clears throat> were brought back to the ghetto to visit family members. We feared tremendously the men in uniform. They walked with their dogs and they would shoot at us for any small infraction. And one day I was playing with my little cousin and a German came and he said, who wants this piece of chocolate? And he showed us a candy and we both ran to him but my cousin was much faster and she came to him before I did. He picked her up, a little girl of four years of age. And with one hand, he gave her the chocolate bar. And with the other hand, he took his revolver and shot her in the head. He got up, threw the body on the floor and walked away. In the camp we were one year, they didn't work tailoring, that was, they made parts of uh, airplanes. And uh, I think I gave it the name, uh, where were this? Uh, I don't remember it exactly. We didn't have no food, we hardly food. We, we went to the garbage and we took out potatoes and then peels from potato, that's what we, we ate there. They had like barrels made and you still uh, sleep one on top of the other. And um, every morning we went out, a whole day we used to work there, a whole day. After this camp, they took us back to Krasnik, and uh, my father went back to work for the military, for the Germans, and that's how we got, we were alive, me and my brother. They took us both into the, uh, I was a little older already, so he took me in to, uh, to work with him. There was a, I don't know, there must have been about 10 people there. So we, we used to help out. It was a little better than Butzin to see my father. He, did, he, he was everything for me. He did everything for me and my brother. I used to like help out my father. I used to give him, I helped him to 
cover the uh, the work, and and I used to make it iron. They used to make iron. You used to you have to blow up the coals. They should start the iron that time. People in the ghetto were going to be taken by train and cattle carts to the extermination camps. When my mother heard about this, she would no longer be a bystander. She would do something, she said to herself. And together with my father, they planned an escape. She took off the Star of David of all our clothing and we walked out of the ghetto. Immediately, we went to the train station. They took us and they put us in cattle trains. Open coal carrying train. It was jammed about 100 or 120 people. We could hardly sit, just sit. No top. And this is in the winter time. Some people passed away. It was a lot of crying and screaming. And we didn't have enough water where the thirst was Horrific. There was only a bucket, you know, for the bathroom. Two brothers there, my beloved mother and father, and quite a few cousins, and uncles and aunts. I had a five-year-old sister, and she asked the, my mother, you know, for some food. Please, I'll take anything what we threw away at home. I'll eat it now. I just can't imagine my parents, how they felt. It was unimaginable. The Germans all over with big dogs barking, schnell, schnell, we should go out from the trains and we shouldn't take no suitcases. They're gonna uh, give it to us later and men on one side and women on the other side. And somebody whispered to me to tell them that I was 18. Well, the couples and SS men were asking the questions. How old I was, what health I am in, because anybody under 18 and over 30 were sent to the gas chambers. I was holding on to my mother and my little sister, my five-year-old sister. Not my older sister. She was got lost and she wasn't with us. I was tall for my age. And he says to me, this right, left, you know, and they separated me from my mother. And if I wouldn't have told them I was 18, I would have been sent to. And I was just about 13. But, and I said, crying. I want to go with my mother. I want to go with my mother. They just shoved me away to the other side. And that was it. Unfortunately, my beloved mother and father, because they were over 30, were sent to the gas chambers. And when they separated us, it was so heartbreaking that there's just no words to describe it. There would be frequent raids where the Germans came to look for hidden Jews. The people within the ghetto, including my family, would, as a butter system, find places of hiding. One of the times I was not allowed in because of my young age. So my aunt bent down and hugged me and said to me, Celia, I love you so much. Here is a blanket. You cover yourself with the blanket and go hide nearby there. You see the ruins of a house? I did as I was told. And sometime during the night, I did hear gunshots. I heard people screaming. A voice rang out. And that voice was saying, Celia, Celia, if you can hear me, we won't see you anymore. My uncle, aunt, and cousins, they were marching towards their death, and now I am alone. We established ourselves in a small city. My father also, he lived hidden behind the closet 
in our room. Uh, he only came out at night. One night he came out when I was very ill and he saw that I was dying. He took off his scarf and put it around my neck to make me feel better and held me in his arms. And I still have the scarf to do to this day. The next day I felt much better and I asked who was this wonderful man who was here with me during the night. And my mother said, there was no one. You were delirious. You thought there was someone here. They shaved our heads. There was showers. Should go into the shower. When I came out from the shower, I met my sister. And oh my, it was unbelievable. I was so happy that we hugged each other. And we were, from then on, we were always together. They sent me to the main camp of Auschwitz. And from the main camp of Auschwitz, they sent me to number three, which is Bunawet, Buna, where I was there for eight months. The kind of slave labor that there's just no words to describe. From carrying railroad tracks, to digging ditches, to bricks. After six weeks, we were in like an A lager, all of us doing nothing. And they told us they can take us to work. So my sister and I volunteered, you know, uh, they took about a thousand girls from that A lager camp. It was, we were folding clothes. And then we found out that the, the clothes that we were folding, when the people, we were near the crematoriums, and the people were coming every day, every day, thousands of people. And they were told, telling them they're going into the shower. And meantime, they went into the crematoriums. And whatever they had, the jewelry, they had a bucket and they threw it in. And the clothes we had to separate, blouses, blouses, dress to dress, you know. And We used to get this much bread once a week, where it wasn't real bread, it was mostly made out of sawdust. And we had a string and a cup. The cup was to get soup and water. And if we were lucky, we used to get soup once a week. If I wouldn't have promised my beloved mother and father that I would survive, I would have not survived. We lived that time with the Uzbekish family. They let us live with them, you know, but there was no food, nothing. So I went and I picked outside leaves and my mother cooked it with salt and that's what we ate. I had to help my father and my mother that they were smuggling and trying to sell things and we were hiding. And my mother came to visit on one of those days that they were brought in she found me. She said, Celia, I will find someone that will save you and hide you. We will have to get you out of the ghetto. I did what she told me, and I managed to get out of the gates of the ghetto. My mom and I made our way to the suburbs of town, to this family who met me at my father's shop before the war. Mom and I hugged, we cried, but both of us knew that we would never see each other again. 1944, they, they, I think the Russians were very close to invade us. So that they took everybody, everybody out. I remember it was raining that, that day, that night it was, and, uh, we were marching to another camp. And then my father took us, he says, to come all the way to the back. They say, uh, Ukraine guy. And, and he took us, he, he paid him some money. And he, he he said to us, go in the ditch and don't, there was a lot of uh, like, uh, it's, it's like a farm, you know? 
So there was a lot of uh, weeds and everything there. It says you go, you run in there, and and then uh, another man saw that what my father's gonna do. So he asked him to to take him to with his daughter. He was with his daughter, and and he the guy the the the, the guy says just run in the weed. Don't go far. Go right, right. Stay right in the beginning because if I'll shoot. I'll shoot far away. So that's how, how we escaped. And and that night I remember my father took off his jacket and was co- he covered me up and we went into the woods. It was chilly. It was raining, raining very, very hard. Maybe that's why uh, he took us into the woods and we were there for about, uh, for about a, a week, maybe 10 days. Well, uh, the Poles were very, very bad. But this time they were scared and they came to us and they gave us food and they knew that the Russians are coming, so they tried to be nice. The war was almost over. The Russians were coming, so they made us march out of the city. They did not want to give any help to the Russians when they would arrive. And so we made our way, sometimes on a bus, on a car, sometimes in a train, while it, the bombs were falling all around us. We made our way to Krakow. My father was left behind. My mother had to make a terrible choice. Both of them had to make a terrible choice because um, in the woods that surrounded Buchach, the partisans lived. The partisans were young people that would harass the Germans. They would have horses, they would ride, they would hide in the woods. The woods were very, very big and the Germans could never find them. So my mother went to the partisans and begged them to take us. But the partisans refused to uh, give us shelter because three children would not survive, would not, would hinder them, would not, would put them in danger because the children cried, the children cannot ride a horse, the children would be a hindrance. And so my mother had to choose, does she save her husband which they allowed them to go with them. The partisans would take my mother and my father, but we would be left behind. And my mother had to see who she saves. Does she save her husband or does she save her children? My father, he was later on found. He was shot in the woods after digging his own grave. And I do not know where he lies. Never been able to bring flowers to his grave. I saw the four members of my family standing in front of a window. What they were looking at was two adults and two children publicly hung because they were hiding two Jewish children. They could no longer keep me. In the morning, my Polish mother, she took me out and we went down to the barn. And she said, Celia, I love you so much. How would you feel if I hid you here in my barn, but your family upstairs won't know about it? And Celia, you're not going to be alone. You're going to have a friend. She took the pitchfork, separated the hay. A skeletal, unkept woman is there. It was my biological mother. Now we were together, mother and I, and we stayed that way for over a year. There was no time, and there was no dates, and there was no, we was just, I don't know, we were nothing. We didn't even cry, it's amazing. 
they uh, started taking apart the crematoriums. Then they took us to another uh, camp, and uh, I worked under uh, uh, what you call ammunition factory. We were so hungry. We just got a small piece of bread in the morning and watery soup lunch. I don't even remember what we had. If we had supper. It was that's that's all we talked about is what we are going to eat when we survive. We still were hoping every day. We just kept asking, where is God? And how could he let something like this happen? I was happy. I saw my brother. It made me very happy that at least one in our family was with us. My brother Sam was in the same camp, same barrack. But God forbid if they would have caught me looking at him, they would have killed me. We were not to look at each other, let alone talk to each other. We were really treated unbelievably inhumanely. We had to march from Auschwitz to Bunewijk. They put us into open coal carrying cars. It was about December time. And out of the 120 people they put into the open coal carrying car, I was the only one that survived. I wound up in Buchwald. Now, in the end, they put us in train, in the cattle trains again, and we were going in the cattle trains, and all of a sudden, the train stopped, and we were in Denmark, and the Danes came with white handkerchiefs, you are free, you are free, you are free. And that's how I survived in, the, in Denmark. The day we were liberated was just any other day. The Russians came, but they were kind to the children. And they gave us chocolate milk, that I remember. It was like a blessing from God. We were, we were very happy. The Russians gave us food and we never had as much food as we got from the Russians. They were just passing by because the goal was to get to Germany. We saw the uh, Russians coming in and uh, liberating everybody and everybody screaming and jumping up. The war is over, the war is over. When we were liberated by the U.S. Army, I weighed very little. I was very skinny and very hungry. And I thought I was to the God sent angels to liberate us because the U.S. Army was very good. The soldier that liberated me was a black soldier. And I thought God sent angels and they were all black. What happened to your father after the Nazis arrived? They took him to a work camp and he came back in 1945 when the war ended, but he died right away from um, a stomach uh, cancer. So they said, but it was probably for torture. I, I was five years old and uh, I was very, very happy, but then Right away, he was hospitalized and died. My father made the first one we got as soon as the war ended. We got back to Poland because my father had the whole family. When we went back to Poland, my father gave me and my sister into another orphanage because my father went to make sure wherever we went to a town, this was in a different town, he wanted to make sure that his father and the brothers and the family was alive but no one survived. People that survived, they went looking for the families. So we were there a while, you know, boys and girls, 
And they, you know, waited till my parents came back and they took us and they put us in a camp. They said they're going to send us back to Russia. And my father heard that. So he went and right away called us, put us, and we ran away to another camp. And, and we were in Bergen Bells, and that was a very big camp. And that's where we stood there for two years. Well, my father was a printer, so he got a job. And from the joint in the UNRWA, they gave him a package with food every, and we were living in one room, five people, because my brother was born in 1946 in, in, in Germany. And I went where the school, the English helped us. And we were in a school and they taught us already there. It was fine, you know, I was a kid. I was 10 years old, 11. I, I learned to ride a bicycle, I fell off. <laughs> I fell, I broke my teeth, I remember certain things. And I had nice boys and girls together, we were in the class talking. It was, we were two years in bergen -Belsen. We lived with my aunt after the war. By the time I started to understand, it was already communist country, and uh, nothing remained in my mind from, from the war. We, we really didn't feel too much pressure from the communism because we were among our own people. We were in school. Our friends were all Jewish. And I was only in a religious circle, so I had no interaction with non-religious non people. My best friend, neighbor across the street, he became an SS officer when I was liberated from the concentration camps and I came home the Russians captured him and they hanged him in the center of the village. My father took us back to the town and then some other people came. Father got back the house we had our, his, our own house a big house. It took my mother a long time to let us know that we are Jewish because she was so afraid of what, not the Germans anymore, but the Poles or the Ukraine, Ukrainians might do to us. I did not remember. At the beginning I did, but slowly I forgot. My father escaped the army, changed his name, and arrived back to Poland. And I said, what? Who are you? Where have you been these four or five years? You know, I haven't seen you. And then he pulled out the original photograph of myself. That was me dressed for that ballet recital. The oldest brother of my father who had gone to Lima, saw on the one of those lists the name of my mother. My brother, who was in Germany, the one who survived, you know, was going on a training. He saw my sister and myself and, you know, because they kept writing about us, who survived. And contacted my mother asking her who she was. And she answered him that uh, she was his sister-in-law, and these were her three nieces, and had the very painful uh, duty to inform him that no one from his family had survived. That in, um, we already were going to Israel, my sister and I, but he, he had, from the highest, he was going to, to America. He had already the papers, so he wrote us a letter, please don't go to, to Israel. We are three of us left. Please let's come to United States. So he begged my mother to please uh, come to Peru. So we were really displaced. We really had no families to go to. And my mother agreed to go to Lima. We gave up Israel and uh, we came to the we came to the United States.
From Poland, we went to, to Austria, to a DP camp, and from Austria, we went to Germany. And from Germany, uh, we went to, to Canada. We couldn't go to the United States, we couldn't get a visa. So my father was a tailor, that's how he got the, uh, the visa to go to Canada. We had family in America, and my cousin, my father's cousin, sent papers, but that time they didn't let in, they didn't let us in. And my father was a printer, and they looked for tailors in Canada. My father signed that. So we went to Canada, uh, my father, that's how they let us in, and we came to, to Montreal. We came to the United States in 1949. My uncle sponsored us, and we came to Boston, not New York. Our uncles lived in Elwood City, Pennsylvania, and they sent us papers to come to America. And he sent us all the papers necessary, and we traveled to Peru. And uh, I was nine years old at the time. My oldest sister was 11, and my youngest sister was six. The Hungarian Revolution came in 1956. That's when everybody ran away. That's when I came here in 1957. You had to have a sponsor. So my half-sister sponsored us, my mother and me. We came on a army plane where they didn't have rows of seats like you have now on, 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 on the jets, but, uh, you know, just on the side seats. And it was a terrible, terrible 24-hour ride. First, we lived in Williamsburg. Then we moved to Washington Heights and then we moved to Hartford, Connecticut. My mother remarried in 1947. The Hyas helped us out a great deal, and they relocated us to Hartford because he was a shochet and a chazan, and they, he had a position in Hartford, Connecticut. That's where I uh, went to high school, and when I was done, I came by myself and lived in Crown Heights and went to Brooklyn College at night until I met my husband and I decided that I don't need college anymore. I, I, I played for the United States against Sweden in soccer. I was a pretty good soccer player. And my uncle said, Celia, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, not finishing your meal and saving it for the next time. You are free. And all I said then, Uncle Harry, I am 14 years old. If this is what America is, can this be my birthday? Meaning I didn't want to remember. I wanted to start from scratch. Uh, I felt free, free and safe. My youngest sister, who was six years old, smiled for the first time when we reached Lima. What does it mean to you to have a grandmother who survived the Holocaust? So I feel very lucky. I think she was very strong to be able to make it through the Holocaust and everything that happened. I feel very inspired. I don't know how they're so strong. Like, I don't think I would be able to speak about it. It's very powerful. You know, it's something I'll remember for the rest of my life. She really was very happy to tell us about her own family and how she survived. And I'm really grateful that I had this opportunity. It was so kind of her and like she was so happy when she came. Like she had a smile on her face and like you could tell how much it meant to her. It made me feel like we were so special and lucky to have her. Even though we're at risk in the middle of a pandemic, she like came all the way here just for us to be able to hear her story. So it was, it was really special that she was able to Come. I'm very grateful that I was able to have this experience because there aren't many Holocaust survivors left, so I'm very glad that I was able to do this. It was just a very exciting and incredible experience that I really enjoyed and think that everyone who has an opportunity to do it is incredibly lucky. I would recommend this project to other kids because it's very important to learn about other people's pasts and 
futures and lifestyle because it helps everybody grow and it spreads love and unity. I feel uh, very inspired because you see the perspectives of what they went through during the war and how they stayed strong. I felt like I was a part of something that is like special. I'm very touched because I've never, I've heard a lot of stories about the Holocaust and I've never been in person with someone. And it like touches me a lot because I've always wanted to talk to someone in person who was a survivor from the Holocaust. I mean, now that the interview is done, I feel sort of kind of re relieved. Like I had a lot of um, stress, like I was gonna have to ask the questions. I didn't wanna make them too emotional. I didn't wanna um, hurt them in any way. And now that it's over, I, I feel like a lot of weight has been lifted off of me. I feel relieved because I was very nervous about talking to um, Izzy forever and now it finished. The thing I liked most was how forthcoming and sharing Mr. Gross was. He didn't hold anything back. He told us everything about his story. She was like so kind. She always wants us to like be like the better of us and just to always like keep your heads up. She seems to focus on all the positives that happened rather than the negatives. And I think I find that really inspiring. I had an experience that would change my life forever and that would show me different ways to go at it. To go out life. It gives, gives you a chance to understand other people. I love Names Not Numbers, probably one of the best experiences in my middle school life. We continue on the story and the story of the Holocaust and keep remembering it. What I learned that regardless of your religion, regardless um you know of your color it is important i feel and the lesson that i learned is to be there to help others be honest caring and giving and talk to each other be open you know this is life and if you want something go for it i think it's very very important to be a good Jew, to be very respectful to the parents, and take good care of yourself, exercise, and become religious. Always be proud of what you are, and speak up. And when you hear all, all this anti-Semitism, you should believe, you should be aware of it, and do something about it. Get together. You should not let them uh strike you down you shouldn't you should be strong enough to make sure that this doesn't repeat again ever fight back to combat anti-semitism i feel like it's the same problem as racism we have to take a stand i think that we have to as a jewish community unite and stay strong together stay strong with your friends and connect with them i feel like if people really dive in like why this is a, why anti-Semitism is a thing, why so many people are killed, then I think that we can come to a, like a realization that they did nothing wrong. They were just living their lives. We're just living our lives like anyone else. Keeping it in mind that at the end of the day, we're all humans, we're all on the same team. Even if we believe in different things, we're all on one team at the end of the day. Always know what their story is before judging. You want to know what happened and not judge by the looks of the person. Always help someone that in need, make new friends so they help other people and like a chain reaction so they, it just keeps on going and going. I'm gonna give like the message that he gave us to just be strong and never give up and always try to find a bright side of something, even when it seems really hard and to just keep pushing yourself and just never stop. There's always light at the end of the dark tunnel that you should always keep going no matter what obstacles are thrown in front of you. The best advice that I can give is that you never should give up no matter how bad it is. Always shoot for the stars. I am the living proof that you can turn around. Their bodies were destroyed but their souls went up to Hashem and they will always be with us. So we must cherish those 
memories of the Holocaust, remember them and never, never allow this to be forgotten. The rest of humanity allow these things to happen. That's why we must never forget it. We cannot be any more bystanders. When we see injustice perpetrated, when we see evil, we must stand up against it. We must let the world hear our voices. We have the power to do good and to prevent evil. If I had the opportunity to have all the survivors together in front of me, I think I would really want to let them know how important it is to us, hearing their story, being able to pass it on to our future generations, and being able to keep strong like their memories. I would first of all like to thank them for coming to tell us a story and teaching us the, about what happened to them. Not many people are able to do that. Once the documentary is done, I think that it's important to show it to younger generations. So it's very important that everyone remembers the tragedies that, that have happened and the, the stories that have come out of it. We want our next generation to know as much as we did and they should be as inspired as we are. I think uh, my great-grandmother will, she'll, she'll think that uh, she'll be happy that I'm doing this because she would want uh, other young people to know what happened, what actually happened in the Holocaust. It's very helpful to have this as video evidence and you can use it uh, for future generations to make sure that this never happens again. I think talking about the Holocaust is important because it's something about our history, like Jewish history, and it's something that shouldn't be forgotten ever. We should continue this uh, for, like, for further down, like generation to generation. I grew up in a Jewish society. Um, everything was the same for me. I was in one place most of my life. For her, everything was changing all the time. It was a confusing and difficult time. So uh, I definitely have a lot of respect for what she went through and nothing in my life compared to, to what she went through. Compared to her, I had the life of a king. She went through all those hardships at such a young age. I remember getting nightmares from watching like clips of horror movies. The trauma this woman has faced as a child and scarred her. I feel terrible that it actually happened to people and I don't think it should happen ever again. Hey, Bobby, do you have any special message for me as your granddaughter? I would like you to continue when you will have children to make sure that they know what happened and they should make sure with their children to know what happened so that this would never happen again. Today we interviewed Holocaust survivors and we got to hear their story. We were really lucky to be able to, be able to speak to our survivor in person one-on-one. -on -one. It was um, a very um, amazing experience. I think that I'm very fortunate to have the ability to do it, especially in this time, um, despite the fact that we had to do it via uh, technology and on Zoom. I think that it was an incredible experience and I'm very lucky to have done it. I just would love to like, thank them so much because this is such a rare thing and I know that in the future my younger brothers may not have this chance. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.